Well, for the last time in a little while, won't you turn to Hebrews? Hebrews chapter 13. I'd have to say that preaching through Hebrews has been one of the highest privileges and one of the greatest challenges of my life as a preacher of the Word of God. Uh, Prior to coming to Ferndale, I had, of course, preached from Hebrews, but I'd never preached through Hebrews from beginning to end. And it was on my heart to do that, and so it was in 2019 that I started preparing this Hebrew series. And on the 19th of January 2020, we started into Hebrews. And a few weeks in, COVID hit. And I thought to myself, I do not want to preach Hebrews online. And so we parked it and uh, did a bunch of stuff, good stuff, I hope, definitely. But uh, then we came back to it about a year ago, March 2022. So many new people had come and so many old people had totally forgotten. So uh, we started in verse 1 again. Did it a bit differently, a little bit more quickly, and, uh, and here we are. And today is sermon number 28, plus the six that we did earlier in, in Hebrews. Now, in the years since deciding to preach through Hebrews, I've studied the letter fairly thoroughly. I've listened to it on audio in my car probably a hundred times as I've driven about over the last three years. I've listened to nothing else but Hebrews uh, for the last two to three years. And I must say, it was with some sadness last night uh, that I packed away my dozen commentaries that have been my friends on this journey, put them back on the shelf where they belong, and uh, not sure when I'll get back to them, if I ever will. But before starting Hebrews, I was convinced that Jesus is better. And since walking through Hebrews, I am more convinced than ever that Jesus is better. I know I'm dating myself when I quote this hymn. But don't worry, I quote some that are far older. (laughs) Remember Jim Reeves' hymn, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Now, because Jesus is better, those who enjoy the benefits of his saving grace and life in them are to obviously live in a particular way. He should make a difference. And this is clearly seen in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 12, if you look at the text. Those verses form a bridge from the first 12 chapters of Hebrews into chapter 13. Therefore, uh, 12, 28... Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, he's just been talking about that, and that is because of the person and work of Christ expounded in all of Hebrews from chapter 1, verse 1. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful 
and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So the proper response to this gracious offer of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, according to those verses, is to be thankful. That's a bit of a no-brainer, wouldn't you say? To be thankful and to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. And uh, that word worship can also be translated service. And as it is back in chapter, chapter 9, verse 14, which is saying that uh, when we talk about worship, we're not confining it to what we do in an hour and a half on Sunday morning. Worship is more than what has happened up to now and what's going to happen in the next minutes through to the end of the service. It involves serving and it involves living for Christ every single day. And uh, chapter 13 illustrates some of the ways in which we worship, some of the ways in which we serve. And uh, it affects every area of our lives. But notice if you look at the last verses of chapter 12, this writer also insists that acceptable worship should be characterized by reverence and awe. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and show and so worship God acceptably. How do we worship God acceptably? We worship him acceptably with reverence and with awe. Now, why would we do that? Well, he tells us. Because our God is a consuming fire. Quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. Now, we don't hear much about that in our day. God is sort of a lekker chummy, you know? Sort of a cool, benevolent, lackadaisical, casual, anything goes kind of a grandfather. But no, no, no. Our God is a consuming fire. Therefore, we should worship him acceptably with reverence and awe because of who he is. And if we have really begun to understand Hebrews, it should have produced in us moments of, of reverence, of utter awe, of amazement. And that should filter into the way we live our lives. Not that that means you're sad all the time or miserable all the time. Reverence and awe doesn't exclude joy. But it's got to be our heart in relation to this God who has revealed himself to us in the person of the Lord Jesus. Raymond Brown said, The confidence we have does not lead to, to a form of cocksure arrogance. Believers are often in danger of either taking these great things for granted or of trivializing them by flippant attitudes and inappropriate language. In the teaching of this passage, the Christian, and I love this, the Christian should live in a spirit of adoring gratitude. For he, she, of all people, have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. A spirit of adoring gratitude. So now in the light of what God has done for us, we're exhorted in chapter 13 to be, and we've looked at these bees in chapter 13, we were exhorted to be loving or caring, to be pure, to be content, to be discerning, to be courageous, to be worshipful, to be loyal, and to be prayerful. That's what chapter 13 is about. That's what we should be. That's what it means to worship God acceptably. It means to be those things. And we covered the first two of them last week. We talked about being caring. Remember the hospitality bit? We talked about uh, caring for those in some form of prison. R remember that? And then we talked about being pure. We talked about marriage and sexual purity. And uh, I'd intended to get a whole lot further than, la than that last week, but I didn't. And I intend to finish the chapter this week, but I won't. Well, we will, <laughs> one way or the other. So let's pick up in verses 7 to 10. We worship God acceptably 
we serve God acceptably by being discerning, verses 7 to 10. And uh, this, in verse, first part of verse 9, this faithful pastor warns his readers, look at it carefully, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. These Jewish Christians to whom this book was originally written were being exposed to a particular brand of, of teaching. And it's explained briefly in verses 9 and 10. Look at verse 9. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which are of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar, and that is the sacrifice of Christ. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle, those of those the old covenant, have no right to eat. I think what the writer has in view here is what the whole book has been about from the beginning. There were certain Jewish teachers who were saying to these Christians, these Jews who had become Christians, but you you, you still need to keep the feast, you still need to eat certain foods, you you still need to follow certain Jewish dietary laws. If you don't do that, you can't be close to God, you can't enjoy the blessing of God. And they were saying, if you're not doing these things, oh, you're in trouble. And so the writer warns them and he says, those days are over. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by the grace of Christ, not by some kind of rituals that had symbolic meaning that no longer have that meaning because fulfillment has been found in the person of Christ. He says it is through Christ alone we can become clean and acceptable, not by rituals. So he says it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace by God's saving and sustaining grace, not by a bunch of rules that had pertinence in the Old Testament but no longer do. Now in New Testament times, there were all sorts of heresies that threatened the early church. And it's interesting if you read through the New Testament, well in the whole of the New Testament in fact, so many heresies arose in the early days of the Christian church in the first few hundred years of the Christian church, that uh, there's practically nothing new under the sun. And any kind of new teaching that we may encounter is normally kind of a a rehash of something old. Uh, Nothing new under the sun. And uh, the Apostle Paul warned when he was saying goodbye to the elders in the church at Ephesus, he warned them against false teaching. And he said, false teaching will come from the outside, but he said, beware, it may also arise from the inside. So for example, in Acts 20, verse 29, he said, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. See, false teachers are like wolves in sheep's clothing. That was the language Jesus used. Even from your own number, he says, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. And in our times, the wider church is plagued by, to use the words of verse 9, all sorts of strange teachings. All sorts of them. You just have to listen. To some, not all, but some of the teaching on, say, a program like, a channel like TBN. And you'll be exposed to all sorts of false teaching. Pop, some of the popular Christian books are riddled with false teaching. You just have to drive around the city and see some of the advertising boards of churches and what they promise. And... Uh, False teaching is placarded all over the place. I know you can't trust everything that Google says, but if you Google false teachers, you'll find a lot of helpful information exposing some of the the false teachings that are going on today. Um, Estimated 
two different brands of false teaching. Uh, and the U.S. seems to be a, the spawning ground for a, a lot of those. Um, Tim Chalice, a, a solid evangelical Bible teacher, identified seven different kinds of false teachers. I can put them into categories. I'm, I'm not going to get into the weeds of this, but just so you know. Um, there's the heretic. And the heretic is the person who blatantly teaches false doctrine, denies the virgin birth, or says that there are many ways to be saved. That's a heretic. And then there's the charlatan, the person who's in it for the money. And you can normally tell that by the houses they live in and the cars they drive and the airplanes they fly. And then there's the prophet, the prophet who is obsessed with predicting the future. And you can often tell a prophet by his language. The Lord told me. Yeah. Whenever a person says that, I get the chrills. You know, the Lord told me. And then there's the abuser, the person with a lot of charisma who exercises power and control and manipulates people. And then there's the embellisher, who makes the Bible say way more than it actually says. They just blur and embellish. And then there's the tickler. Remember, Paul spoke about that in 2 Timothy. He said, people, preachers, who will say what people's itching ears want to hear. They just tickle your ears with telling you lacquer stuff that makes you feel lacquer. You know, you know, we won't mention any Joels, I mean any names. Um, <clears throat> and then there's the speculator, person who goes into endless speculation about stuff that the Bible doesn't actually give anything definitive on. We could go on. In Michael Kruger's church, he's one of the, the commentators, one of the commentators I've used on Hebrews. He said in, this, in their church, they had a Sunday school class and the, the, the title of the Sunday school class was Bad Christian Books. That was, and they, they just had a series on bad Christian books. And they went through one another. What's wrong with that book? What's wrong with that book? What's wrong with that book? That would be a, would be a helpful series. He offered some sound advice regarding how to discern false teachers. He said, quote, One way we recognize false teaching is by simply understanding that it is strange. That's the word that's used in verse 9. By simply understanding that it is strange or new. It is not what the church has historically taught or what the Bible says. A teaching that is old is perhaps not as appealing as one that is new and shiny. But at the seminary where I teach, I often say, we are happy to be unoriginal. We should teach what Christians have always seen and found to be wonderful and help them see it again in fresh ways. So when we encounter some new teaching, we need to ask first and foremost, what does the Bible say about that? I know that's tricky because all the false teachers quote the Bible. We also need to say, what has the church historically taught about it? What, what did the Puritans teach about it? That's a, good, that's a good test. They knew the Bible far better than many modern people. And we need to apply that test to the so-called progressive theology that is becoming rampant in our day. Progressive theology that makes practices permissible and justifies them in the name of love that are forbidden in Scripture and are, would be unthinkable in historic Christianity. So those are good tests to apply. So to help us discern teaching, we must listen to what this pastor writer says in our, in our text in verses 7 and 8, and we'll, we'll come back to it in a moment. But he says, remember your leaders. He says to these people who were in danger of being led back into false teaching, he says to them, 
in verse 7, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. So there were obviously leaders that this group of Christians had known. Maybe they had died. Possibly they had even been martyred. And he says to them, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then, above all, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Raymond Brown said, although godly leaders of the past have gone, the eternal, living, and changeless Christ is still alongside us. He is always our contemporary. The same This is probably the best known text in Hebrews. The same yesterday and today and forever. In the great yesterday of world history, he died for us as our unique sacrifice. Today, he is the forerunner who has already entered heaven and is now, today, interceding for us at the Father's right hand. The future is fully known to him. He lives forever, the Lord of history, and he will certainly return as he promised to do for those who are eagerly waiting for him. Chapter 9, verse 28. So, be discerning. Be discerning. Don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Fix your eyes on the scriptures. Fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Now next, if we go to verses 11 to 14, we're exhorted there. Be discerning, we're exhorted now to be courageous. Look at verses 11 to 14, let me read. Verse 11, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp and so Jesus and he's the one to whom all of those sacrifices pointed remember and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Now, unlike most of the Old Testament offerings where the priests, the priests, and there were many of them on shifts through the days and months in the the tabernacle and temple uh, practices, they they would be given a portion of meat from most of the sacrifices. But the sacrifice, the sin offering offered on the Day of Atonement once a year, they could eat nothing from that sacrifice. The blood was sprinkled on the altar in the most holy place, but the whole of the body was burned outside the city. That was the part of that Requirements. You can read about it in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 27. But Jesus, who is the ultimate sacrifice, the fulfillment of those Day of Atonement sacrifices, the our sin offering, Jesus, we read in John, 7, in, in John 19, 17, was similarly crucified outside the gates, outside the city of Jerusalem. He was crucified outside the gates, look at the text, to make the people holy through his own blood. So the cru- Jesus' crucifixion outside of the city of Jerusalem was the, in a, in a way the, the sort of culmination of the rejection and scorn and scoffing over and over again and then, and then last of all he was crucified outside crucified among criminals in a place of execution where the scum of the earth and the criminals were, were, that's where he was taken. Not inside Jerusalem, outside 
just like the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement was outside the camp of Israel, not inside the camp. Jesus outside the city, not inside, to make us holy by his blood. And so figuratively, this is what the text is saying, believers must join him outside the camp of the world, no longer being part of the unholy systems and practices. And in the case of these Jewish Christians, to whom he wrote this letter originally, don't go back into the camp. Don't go back to Judaism. You be willing to identify with Christ who suffered outside. You be willing, you be willing to be an outsider to, do the, to Judaism. Why? Because that's obsolete. It's found fulfillment in the person and work of the Lord Jesus. So look at verse 13 is the, is the, in, the, the call to be courageous. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. So following Jesus completely may mean rejection and reproach by society. Moses experienced that. If you just glance back to chapter 11, verse 26, it's probably quite near where you are. Chapter 11, verse 26 says, Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now the writer here says a similar thing in verse 14. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we're looking for one that is to come. In other words, our, as, we, as we stand with Christ, as we go with Christ outside the camp, as we stand up for Christ, we may face ostracism and difficulty and persecution, in some cases uh, rarely, but in some cases even death. But he says, remember, this world is not our home. We're looking for an enduring city. Let me give you an example an, an example of this. Um, John Wilson and Irene and Leslie Artingstall, our administrator, meet. We have a little meeting every Tuesday afternoon to review uh, how Sunday's gone, what's going to happen next week, and uh, who, who, what some of the needs are, and so on. And uh, we took a break over December, and when we, when we started meeting again in January, you do what you do in your first meeting after the holidays. You say, well, tell us about your holidays. So we were having a little chit-chat around the table, a cup of tea and a biscuit, and, uh, and it, was, it, it was lacquer. And then... Um, Leslie, we said, well, how, how, how was your Christmas? How was your Christmas, Leslie? And she, and she said, well, we had an interesting experience. We were invited to a, to a gathering, mostly of people we didn't know. And uh, when we arrived there, a discussion was going on in which uh, one very vocal person and others were joining in were, were castigating Christians and Christianity and the church, and they were just trashing Christ and the church and um, and Leslie said I was sitting there thinking do I what do I do you know, what do I do and with uh, I think her heart in her mouth in her throat she said in this group of strangers at a Christmas dinner I'm a Christian and with those words she stepped outside of the camp and bore the reproach Christ bore just by those words. And we will find ourselves in situations where we will need to take a stand and speak a word, whether it's in your office, whether it's at school or at varsity or in a family context, where simply stating what you believe on a particular unpopular issue, and there are many of them today. You just say, uh, you believe in hell, and you'll be outside the camp. You just need to say, Jesus is, I believe that Jesus is the only way to God, and you'll be, you, you're going outside the camp. 
You just need to take a stand on gender and sexuality and marriage that we talked about last week, and you will be stepping outside the camp of popular opinion, of culture, of political correctness. And you will get the look, or you will be shunned, or you will be told that you're stupid and old-fashioned and out of touch with reality. But remember, the text says, when you go outside the camp, you go to him. Let us go to him outside the camp. That's where he is. And that's where we find ourselves. And this is the, the challenge of living as Christians. Are we willing to do that? It takes courage to do that. It took courage for Leslie to say those three simple words, I am a Christian. And that's sometimes all it takes. And you might find then that other people who've been sitting there with their mouths shut because they don't have the guts to identify with Christ will then slowly put up their hands and say, well, I, I, I'm also one. And sometimes it takes one person in an office space or in a context to bring other fearful ones along and help them take a stand for Christ. So be courageous. And then number three, be worshipful. I'll just, I'm not going to spend long on this. Verses 15 and 16. You see, reflection on Jesus once for all sacrifice for us outside the camp to save us from our sins prompts this pastor to say, uh, this is how you should respond. This is the kind of sacrifice with which you should respond to his sacrifice. His sacrifice for us demands a sacrifice on our part for him. But what, what kind of a sacrifice? Well, look at verses 15 and 16. Through Jesus, therefore, always, I've said it over and over again. You, the therefore, say it, it, just, it just flows on. He's arguing from one to the other. Through Jesus, therefore, the same Jesus who suffered outside the camp for you, the same Jesus who by his blood purchased your forgiveness. Through Jesus, therefore, let us, the recipients of that grace, continually offer to God a sacrifice. What kind of a sacrifice? Look at the text. A sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Verse 16, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such, what's the word? For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And so these are the offerings that we are to make to him in response to him offering himself for us. These are not uh, offered to secure our salvation. We're not doing these things in order to merit anything. We're doing these things as an expression of gratitude. For his grace. So look at, look at the text. What sacrifices are we to offer continually as a way of life to God? Well, there's, there's, the first one is a sacrifice of thankful praise. Offer a sacrifice of praise. And we do that when we sing songs, as we, as we did earlier. And when you sing from your heart, not with, with your lips, you thank God for all that he is, all that he's done, but not only here. See, that sacrifice of praise happens when you put your knees on the carpet at home in your daily quiet time. And you thank God, having read the scriptures and having reveled in what God has done for us. I, mean, I had that experience this morning, read a chapter in Isaiah Chapter 44, I think it was. And you, you can't read that without wanting to put your knees on the carpet and say, oh God, thank you. Thank you, thank you for who you are. He says, I made you, I formed you, I redeemed you, you're mine. And, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. But it's not only then, it's as you, as you, as you stand under a shower and you think, Wow, oh, Lord, thank you that I can, thank you that I can have a shower. Do you even stop to thank God for that? And 
thank, thank, thank God that I can, that, that I can wee. I mean, you, you think of the people who, who, who can't because of illness. I mean, they, 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 we, we cannot live a day without thanking God for so, so much. And you, every, every morsel of food you put into your mouth is a gift of God. Everything. So you offer a sacrifice of praise, even when in your heart you say, Lord, thank you for this. Wow, oh, this is great. And you say grace before the meal, Lord, thank you for this food. Don't take those things for granted. These are all gifts of grace. A person can receive nothing, not even one thing, John the Baptist said, unless it is given from heaven. And so thankfulness needs to be part of our part of our lifestyle, part of our vocabulary. And then there's the sacrifice of unashamed witness, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And so that's a sacrifice when you verbalize your faith in Christ and your gratitude to Christ. And then there's the fruit of active sacrificial kindness, verse 15 and, or verse 16 rather, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So when you, when you help somebody, when you, do your, when, you, when you do the dishes, when you give somebody a lift, when you put a few sandwiches together and give them to the guy at the robot, I mean, on and on we could go. That is an act of worship. It's a sacrifice with which God is well pleased. For him to be pleased, he must see it. For him to be pleased, it must matter to him. And for it to be a sacrifice, it must cost you something. It doesn't have to cost an enormous amount. Some sacrifices do. But some sacrifices are not hugely costly. But every sacrifice costs something. Even if it's a moment of your time sending a text to encourage somebody else. With such sacrifices... God is well pleased. And then, number four, be loyal. I pointed out, and this is some important stuff we're getting into, I pointed out last Sunday that verses 7 and 17 are both about church leadership. Remember that? And they kind of bracket this section, which is the heart of Hebrews 13. Verse 7 Verse 17. And verse 7 refers to past leaders, and verse 17 refers to present leaders. Verse 7, Paul's, I mean, the, the writer is writing to a congregation of people, maybe several congregations. Verse 7, he says, Remember your past leaders, those who've died, gone to heaven, entered into their reward. Remember them. And then in verse 17, he talks about your present leaders, obey your present leaders, submit to their authority. So look at the part, what he says about past leaders first. Verse 7, remember your leaders who spoke, past tense, who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So bearing in mind, again, the Jewish Christians to whom this letter was written. Uh, Stuart Olliot, I love his little expanded paraphrase of verse 7. He says, In the past, you've had wonderful leaders. Call them to mind. They were men of faith noted for presenting a true message and giving godly example. Consider afresh the lives they lived and the way their lives ended. Instead of giving up the faith and life, that they instructed you in, copy that faith and follow that example. In short, imitate them. Every four to seven years, Irene and I end up going back to Canada where her, some of her family is. And, uh, and we always go back to Prairie Bible College where we both studied and where I taught for seven years before coming back to, to South Africa. And uh, Prairie Bible College, as the name implies, is on the prairies. It's, it's, it's a flat, you know, you can stand on a 50 cent piece and see 100 miles in every direction. You know, it's just flat, the, the, wheat, the wheat basket of the world, sort of like Ukraine. 
just a wheat basket of the world. And uh, that Bible college community is in a small town about 80, 100 kilometers northeast of the city of Calgary, if you're familiar with your Canadian geography. And uh, when we studied there, there's a community, the community of the Bible College was a few thousand, had probably 700 students in the Bible College. There was a Christian high school of 300, a staff of about 300, and it was in a little town of about three or 4,000 people. So not a, not a big community. And uh, a kilometer west of town is the town cemetery, Three Hills Cemetery. And every time without fail, every time we go back there, and we did it again in 2019, we take a few hours to go to the cemetery and we walk up and down and looking at those gravestones because so many of those gravestones in that cemetery are the burial places, mark the burial places of men and women that we knew who taught us as students, who had us in their homes, showed us hospitality, and we'll walk up and down, we'll stop, and we'll remember. And I, I've, I went through my phone yesterday and I found all the pictures of the cemetery. I wish we could show them to you, but it wouldn't mean much to you. But I, you, you, you stop in front of a grave and you think, I remember. I remember the way that person lived. I remember what they taught. Their fingerprints are on my life. And if, I, if I'm ever tempted to depart from the faith, I just have to walk around that cemetery and say, huh? If that was the kind of faith that produced that kind of a life, there can't be much wrong with it. I'm not going to stray from that. And that's what the, that's what the writer is saying here. Yeah, you know, remember, and you think of it, remember the people who lived Christ before you and spoke the word of God to you. Remember your grandmother. Remember your grandfather. Remember some of those stalwarts in the church in the, in the early days, people who've gone home to heaven now, but who used to teach you when you gathered together for the breaking of bread service on a Sunday morning or the gospel service on a Sunday evening. The people who came and spoke at your camps, your mother who read you Bible stories. Think of those people. He says, remember them. Consider their teaching, remember their faith. Don't depart from that. Don't depart from that. That's what he's saying to these people. Remember your leaders. And then they're the present leaders. Look at verse 17. He says, have confidence. Well, the ESV is obey. They have confidence. It's probably b- both right, but I think the ESV has a little more bite, doesn't it? Uh, Obey your leaders, your present leaders in your local church and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. So the church leaders here in view are the pastors and elders who are responsible and what a what are those of us who are pastors and elders, we are responsible, according to this scripture, to keep watch over the flock as a shepherd guards a flock, as a sentry on military service keeps watch, as a guard, a watchman on guard duty keeps watch. That's the, the image here. That's the role of Christian leadership, of church leadership. Verse 17 has been called a text that terrifies. A text that terrifies. Because of these words, they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. And It terrifies me, although probably not as much as it should, to think that one day I will stand before God 
and be held accountable to the him to him for the way I have watched over you. That's, that's scary. And it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be one of many motivating factors for elders to be faithful in our task of eldering. Church leaders have authority, according to that text, but it's a delegated authority. We don't have that authority in ourselves. Christ is the head of the church, and he, as he is the chief shepherd, and he has delegated to under-shepherds authority to watch over his people. And to lead, but not to lord. Peter warns about that in 1 Peter 5, 3. Don't lord it over those entrusted to you, but be an example to them. So we're not to be, we have authority, but we're not to be authoritarian or dictatorial or abusive. And what are the members' responsibility? Well, you're not going to get off the hook. You're listening. Anyone home? Look closely at the text. Have confidence in, or ESV, obey your leaders and submit, obey, submit to their authority. Not a popular word in our day, is it? We don't want to submit to anybody. But that's what the text says. Submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this, that is, submit, have confidence in, so that their work will be a joy and not a burden because that would be of no benefit to you. So submission to God-ordained church leadership is for the good of all of us. That's what God's word says. And as you submit to godly leadership, the text says their work their work of watching over you, of caring for you spiritually, keep helping you to keep from sin and to follow God, their work will be a joy, not a burden. Again, the ESV, it's a, it uses the word groaning. It will give them joy. It won't cause them to groan. That's a kind of a strong word, you know. Do you ever groan at your kids? Ah, yeah. Well, that's, that's, a, that, that's the picture. And I, I can say that as a, as a pastor, I have known both great joy and incredible groaning. I can say with, I can say with John the Apostle in 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. There's no greater joy than to see you growing in your walk with God and in seeking to obey and follow God. No greater joy than that. But I can also identify with the Apostle Paul who wrote this to the Corinthian church where he said, who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? And Good elders know both joy and groaning. And there's gener they generally are there at the same time. And that's the way God planned it. So besides obeying your leaders, there's another thing you must do for us. Look at verses 18 and 19. This is the end of it. Be prayerful. This pastor pleads, and you can sense it in his words, the pastor writer who wrote this letter, verse 18, he says, pray for us. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. Guys, we're, we're, we're doing our best. We're seeking to walk honorably before God. We're not perfect, but that's our heart. And then he says, this is a very personal one. I particularly urge you to pray 
so that I may be restored to you soon. So the reason he had, had wrote this letter to them was because he was away from them, and that's why he had to write the letter. Thank God, otherwise he wouldn't have the letter. He would have just said it to them. But he wrote it to them, so we've got it. That was God's plan. But oh, he wanted to be with them. He wanted to be with them. Because it's, there's nothing like being with people that you love. I cannot begin to tell you the, the joy yesterday afternoon at the day out as we finished off the day. We, there were about, I'm not, some, some folk had to leave early, but there were probably 60 or 70 of us who sat around in that hall in a big circle. Big, big circle. And uh, what a sight it was to see, to look around that room and see old and young, rich and poor, students, not the, whole, the whole mixture, people who've been at Ferndale for 50 years, people who were born and raised in Ferndale, people who just came three weeks ago, and the whole, the whole, all around that circle. I thought, this is, this is church. This is the church. And the thing that people around that circle had in common was this Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us and brought us into his family. And I, as, I, as I drove home, I thought, oh, shucks. I missed an opportunity. What we should have done is have people stand up in different categories. You know, if you've been at, if you've been at Ferndale 50 years, stand up. If you've been here two weeks, stand up. You know, just, just to see the mix of uh, the variety. That's, that's the, the wonder of it. And uh, so we need to pray. We, 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 we need to we, we, as, as leaders who have responsibility for leading, we need your prayers. I need your prayers. As elders, we need your prayers for a whole lot of reasons. It could take another five sermons to tell you about. So pray for us. That, that's our, if, if you don't pray for us, please start praying for us. Great joy when somebody comes to me, as someone did just recently, and says, I pray for you every day. I pray for you every day. I was having lunch with a friend. He came and sat on our patio. He's not part of Ferndale. But I con conducted the funeral of his wife who died of brain cancer a number of years ago. I walked a road with her. And I meet with him periodically. And Irene made us a sandwich. And we sat on our patio and had lunch. And as then we were running out of time. And I said, well, I'll, 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 I'll quickly. Uh, no, we didn't, we didn't even have time to pray. I said, well, let's, let, let's pray as we, as we go because the next person was there to see me. And he looked at me and he said, I pray for you every morning. Wow. Thank you. That's the best gift you could ever give me. So pray for us. That's our echo. All the elders, amen that. Now as we conclude, I want to pray for you and for us. And I want to pray the prayer that this pastor prayed for the people to whom he wrote this letter. So won't you stand with me? And the prayer is in verses 20 and 21. And it's a prayer that he prayed for them, but he also included himself and others, other leaders, in the prayer. So let's pray. I'm going to read this prayer and just soak it in. Every, every word, I can easily preach a whole sermon on it. Let's, this is my prayer for you and indeed for me. And it's with this that he just about ends this, what he calls a brief word of exhortation. Now, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever 
and ever. Amen.